Uh, hey everyone, it is I, DPX. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, DPX Talks, for about an hour. If you're watching this, you might notice my hair is a little weird like that, but don't worry about that. Uh, you probably didn't notice. That's something that just bothers me quite a bit, but, uh, yeah, uh, I'm back by myself today. Um, I got into a bit of a groove doing, uh, these episodes earlier in the month, but, uh, it's later in the month. Uh, it is September 28th. Uh, 2023, we got some stuff to talk about, you know, I got some stuff like, uh, a lot concerning the Hollywood strikes, you know, the, the writer strike has ended, the, uh, the actor strike, you know, is on, there's discussions about that, that could end soon, and, uh, but there's been an authorization to strike against video games for the actors. Uh, Jim Ryan of PlayStation steps down. Uh, Netflix with their oh with their drop a one like revealing a bunch of animated shows. Uh, we'll have more to say on that uh, a bit late on the news, but I still want to talk about this. The Xbox leak. It was that was like the that must be the biggest leak in all of gaming ever. Uh, all that and more, uh, but we're going to start off with some smaller topics. Uh, one of which is, uh, this one came out earlier this week. Uh, I, this was going to be like a bigger topic, but I wasn't quite sure what to say exactly. Like how much I had to say, but uh, Hideki Kamiya is leaving uh, Platinum Games. If you guys don't know, Hideki Kamiya is... He, uh... He, he... He's the he well he I, I was gonna say he was the founder of uh, Platinum Games. I'm not sure if he was the the founder, but he definitely did like help create the company. So uh, reading off of uh, End Gadget, Bayonetta director Hideki Kamiya is leaving Platinum Games after helping to found the company back in 2006 when it was called Seeds Inc. Uh, Kamiya was recently promoted to VP, so this move comes as a slight surprise. He recently said on social media that it was by no means an easy decision to make. Kamiya has still still has a couple of weeks on his post as he officially exits the company on October 12th. As for the why of it all, he wrote that the move, quote, came after a lot of consideration based on my own beliefs but didn't offer further explanation. He says he says he says he's still going to make games in his Hideki Kamiya way, uh, but hasn't announced if he's heading to another company, starting his own, or even just planning to tinker away in a garage somewhere. He's only fifty two, so a complete retirement is highly unlikely. So yeah, this does, you they did get this one right. This is like it is a slight surprise because, yeah, he was recently voted to uh, vice president. But at the same time, I feel like, you know, give him his flowers. Um, he, uh, he, he's he got a reputation, a good one, uh, you know. And who else can you say that, like, you know, they block you and that's a badge of honor. They block you on Twitter. You know, Hideki Kamiya, he was known for, like, basically any any text he sees that's, like, not in Japanese or any, like, anyone he just doesn't know that shows up, he just blocks you. Um, and they had to leave Twitter because he was blocking everybody uh, during the whole craze over the, the whole Bayonetta 3, like, voice acting thing. Um, but, so... I don't really know what to think about this. Uh, it seems like... It, it does seem all of a sudden, and it does kind of seem like it's happening quite quickly, because he's not the only... Uh, he, he's not the only uh, executive or whoever from a company that's leaving the company that I'm going to be talking about today. But the other guy leaves in March, you know, of 2024. Hideki Kamiya leaves... In a, few, in a couple of weeks. So, uh, I guess thank you, Hideki Kamiya, for your work uh, with Platinum Games. And, yeah, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to see what he's got left. If he even... Uh, it said, you know, a complete retirement's unlikely, but I, I'm interested to see what he does next. Uh, next up, 
So Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 is a thing that's happening. A game that I, I'm, I'm not feeling the hype for this one. I'm, I'm just not. You know, I, I, I was feeling the hype for, uh... The first one, even... I'm, I'm gonna repeat this every time I bring up the first game. I was not one of those people saying, Oh, this is a smash killer. Because that's just... That's setting expectations that will never be met. This game is will not be the smash killer. And, it's, and it shouldn't be the smash killer. It shouldn't try to be the smash killer. You know? It's, but, like... Smash is a platform fighting game. It shouldn't be every platform fighting game is a smash killer. You know what I mean? That shouldn't be what we think of it as. You know, uh, Doom and Wolfenstein, you know, those were like the f first uh, first person shooters ever. It's not like every first person shooter after that is, oh, this is the Doom killer. I don't know if that was the best example, but like, but yeah, but we got an official release date for Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2. As reading on Nintendo Everything, Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 just received a final release date. Gil Game Mill, Ludosity, and Fair Play Labs have announced that the title will arrive on November 3rd, 2023. Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 was first revealed back in July. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just goes on. So, yeah, at least I do like that they actually kind of fucking announced that, like, they announced a release date. I remember with Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 1, uh, they didn't really, like, formally announce, like, they didn't proper, I, I don't remember them properly announcing the release date. I remember listening to an interview, uh, and the, uh, the creator was like, oh yeah, it's coming out October, whatever the fuck, you know. Uh, well, that was a little weird, but look, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in the roster so far. It doesn't seem like every character is returning, which they don't necessarily need every character to return, but the character roster wasn't that big in the first place. So I don't really understand why you don't have everybody return. Um, and also, the the new characters they're adding... Why is my... Okay, the light's a little wobbly. The new characters they're adding are a little, like, confusing. Like, you have... Like, in total, you know, across both games, you have three characters from Hey, Ar from hey Arnold. None of them are Arnold. Like, I don't understand how you fucking make that mistake. You know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, I'm... I feel like I'm more likely to play it now that it's coming out in November because I think I saw somewhere that at one point... Excuse me. I think I saw somewhere at, at one point that it was going to come out on uh, October, like, 24th, which is the same day as the Metal Gear Solid uh, Master Collection. That is... Three days before Alan Wake 2, that is just after Sonic Superstars and Mario Wonder and Spider-Man 2 come out, that I would have not played that game. I would not have played this game had it come out then. So, yeah, uh, I don't know if I'm, I still don't know if I'm going to play it, like, on the 3rd. That might, that still might be, you know, too close to all the other shit that comes out. But, I think I'm still, I'm, I'm going to play it. And depending on whether or not it's good, if it's good, it's good. If it's not good, uh, this is the last Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl game I'm playing. Because uh, Game Mill, I noticed with their Nickelodeon license, they do this. Like, look at the Nickelodeon Kart Racers games. There's three of them, and they release a new one every single, like, every two years. So, they released, the last one they released was last year. Uh, but the, the, the one they released before that was... Uh, in 2020. Yeah, 2020. And then 2018 was the one before that. So, next year we're getting new Nickelodeon Kart Racers. And then in 2025 is Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 3. And if 2 is not good, if I don't like 2, I'm not going to play 3. So, that's, that's how it's going to be. You know? Um, moving on. Uh, this one is more... Uh, I got some wrestling news. Uh, there's actually a lot of wrestling news that I, that has gone by, but I, there's one I want to talk about in particular. Um, for a while, we've been hearing a lot of like uh, people from WWE going over to AEW. You know, 
that happened for a while, you know what I mean? But it's rare we see the other way around, you know? That happened, we, we heard that with Cody Rhodes, you know? Although that was like, he was originally in WWE. Uh, but, uh, and I've, we heard about uh, Brian Pillman Jr. going to uh, WWE after AEW. Uh, but he hasn't, like, really debuted yet, necessarily. Uh, but, uh, the big one that everyone's talking about is Jade Cargill. Um, now, I'm gonna be real with you, like, I'm on and off with WWE, I'm on and off with AEW, I watch both of them, but, like, every now and then, you know, I will say I do watch WWE more, I guess it's just because that was the one I grew up with, so, uh, it's not a tribalism thing, if, if you're here with for that wrestling tribalism thing, you could actually, like, go... You can go with uh, your console wars buddies and uh, fuck off, all right? Because uh, I'm not about that. Uh, I like all video games. I like all wrestling. So, yeah. Uh, but anyways, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with Jade Cargill. I would with AEW. I mainly watch the pay per views. So like, I only saw her like in the pay per views, you know. But she had that long ass title reign. Like an, an obscenely long title reign, uh, and uh, yeah, like the, that alone made Jade Cargill like a star, and uh, I, her contract expired, and she decided not to re-sign with AEW, uh, and I feel like she did that knowing like I feel like not too many people in AEW could just not resign and they would still have to go to WWE you know um i feel like jade cargill she did not resign like she said in interviews her goal was always to start off in like AW but then make it to WWE um i think she chose not to resign with AW knowing that like WWE is going to like call her up in a heartbeat after that and from my understanding, I think they did do that. And they made a big deal about her signing with WWE. Like, I'm kinda, I'm actually kind of surprised how big of a deal they made about that. Like, obviously, like, they, I was expecting them to make a big deal. But I wasn't expecting... Like, she hasn't made her, her debut. Like, they announced that she signed with the company. Like, when she signed. I wasn't... I was expecting maybe, like, a debut first. Or maybe, like, a lead-up to the debut before they announced that she's with the company. Uh, sorry about that. An intruder. Uh, it was definitely an intruder that came into my house and not my brother. But, uh... Yeah, uh... I kind of forgot what I was saying, but Jade Cargill was... Yeah, no, I, th I think it's kind of weird that they, like, just decided once she signed uh, with the company, they're like, Jade Cargill has signed with the company, you know, but, like, I don't even know when we're seeing her debut, like, like it, her in-ring debut, at, like, at WWE. Uh, it has been said that, like, she would start off on the main roster immediately, uh, so that's interesting. And, yeah, I'm, uh... I'm interested to see what they do. This is this seems to be like the biggest WWE signing since Cody Rhodes, you know. And I feel like it's cool because like I th she's like the first AEW star to go to WWE. Like I mean, the yeah, there's Cody Rhodes, but he was he, he was already in WWE before that and he was he made it big in other places as well. Jade Cargill, I don't think I heard of her before AEW. Uh, and then she made the jump to WWE. So, like, she got big in AEW and then made it to WWE. So I think that's cool. And I'm interested to see what else, what, what uh, that becomes. So, next up <clears throat> is uh, an interesting one. This one is uh, quite interesting. <laughs> I just said that. But, uh, so, it has been announced and it's now happened that... Uh, FIFA, you know, you all know FIFA, the annual soccer game. Well, FIFA, the game series has now been has been renamed to EA Sports FC because EA has lost the FIFA license. But now something is, because of that is going on, and that is 
uh, EA starts pulling its FIFA games from digital storefronts. <clears throat> Reading off of Money Control, uh, Electronic Arts has been pulling its FIFA branded games from digital storefronts like Steam. The series has now been rebranded to EAFC. That was EA Sports FC. Uh, the first title in the lineup called EAFC uh, 24 will be launched on September 29th, so that's tomorrow. All FIFA titles from FIFA 14 to 23 cannot be bought on digital storefronts anymore. Though FIFA 22 and 23 can still be played through the EA Play subscription. Um, and that's that's it. So, yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. EA is removing all of uh, FIFA, like, every, every, every FIFA game from from 13 to 23. For, the, so for like, the past 10 years. Or how it, whatever it was. I, I might have already forgotten exactly what it was. But, um, doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah. I don't know what to make of that, but that's quite crazy. What do you guys think? But moving on <clears throat> to some of the bigger topics. Uh, we got... So, I like PlayStation. I really started to love them, like, during the PS4 era. And that was when... Uh, and, that, yeah, that was when uh, Tom Layden was the uh, president of PlayStation. Or most of... He was, for the most part, he was president of PlayStation during that era. Um, but he stepped down a while back and got replaced by Jim Ryan. And Jim Ryan, uh, to say the least, has been a bit of like, I feel like he's been a bit divisive, you know. Um, lately, PlayStation haven't made the best decisions under him. Uh, you know, stuff like raising the prices of PS Plus when, like, they're offering nothing new, nothing to justify the raised prices, you know what I mean? Like, that's dumb. And going from, oh yeah, we believe in generations. All of our new-gen games are gonna be new-gen exclusives. Going from that to making, like, God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West... And Forza, not Forza, that's Xbox. Uh, Gran Turismo 7. Both, like, all those cross-gen. That was under him. That was under him. So, uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, sorry about that pause. I opened up an article, and as it turned out, I had to sub subscribe to the article in order to read more of it. Uh, so, I change the article but as it turns out jim ryan is stepping down from his role as playstation president um so reading from the verge the headline is playstation leader jim ryan to retire after 28 years with sony uh jim ryan took over as president and ceo of sony interactive in 2019 after starting with sony europe in 1994 so it reads, Jim Ryan, the head of PlayStation and CEO of Sony Interactive, is stepping down. In a press release on Wednesday, which was yesterday, Sony announced that Ryan will retire in March 2024. While Sony, while, <laughs> Sony, <laughs> while Sony, Group, uh, Sony Group Corporation President and Chief Operating Officer Hiroki Totoki will take on the interim CEO role starting April 1st, 2024, April Fool's joke. Uh, I don't know why I said that like that was not the end of the sentence. It was the end of the sentence, but uh, in quotes, this is from uh, this is from Jim Ryan. Uh, After 30 years, I have made the decision to retire from uh, Sony Interactive uh, Enterprises in March 2024. I've relished the opportunity to have a job I love in a very special company, working with great people and incredible partners. Um, but I found it increasingly difficult to reconcile living in Europe and working in North America. I will leave uh, having been privileged to work on products that have touched millions, lot 
millions of lives across the world. PlayStation will always be part of my life, and I feel more optimistic than ever about the future of Sony Interactive Enterprises. So, I mean, the first thing I kind of get out of that is, uh... He finds it difficult to work for a company in North America when he's in Europe. I don't know, move? Like, I know move, moving's, like, easier said, said than done, but, like... You're the, you're the president of PlayStation. You could do it. But, anyways, um... I'm going to read a bit more from the article. Ryan has worked at Sony for 28 years, starting his career at the company's European branch in 1994, where he's held several leadership positions, including the head of global sales and marketing in 2019. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm bad at reading, by the way. It was uh, sales and marketing, period. In 2019, Ryan replaced John Kodira as president of CEO interactive entertainment okay so i i i forgot about john kadira i guess uh he was in between uh sean uh uh tom laden oh, wait is his name sean laden or tom laden wait I, I, f I feel stupid now It was Sean Layden. I'm so stupid. I think I was calling him Tom Layden earlier. But, um, yeah, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I completely forgot. No, no, so, whatever. Um, so yeah, Jim Ryan is stepping down. Uh, I got mixed feelings about this because the main thing he did oversee was the launch of the PS5. And I feel like the PS5 launched decently well. You know, it didn't have the, uh, major launch, uh, like, a major launch. Like, a lot of its biggest launch titles, like Spider-Man Miles Morales, you know, um, and Sackboy, I guess, and Bug Snacks, those were all cross-gen. The biggest new-gen exclusive was probably Demon Souls, and that was a remake you know, and also a game that's not really for everybody, so it could be a system seller, but I don't know how well that sells a system, you know what I mean? Um, but, like I said, there is, like, I understand, like, maybe having certain games be, like, cross-gen, because for a while, the PS5 was really hard to get. And the at the same time, the PS4 install base was still huge. Um, so I get, like... I get a game like Spider-Man Miles Morales. Or Sackboy. I get those being cross-gen. But... When they got, when they got to 2022... You know, they didn't, it wasn't even like 2021, you know, that was the year they had Ratchet and Clank, which I really liked, uh, Returnal, which is one of the few roguelike games I actually like, um, you know, when we got to that, those are PS5 exclusives, they still are not on PS4, so 2022 came around, and all of a sudden, Horizon Forbidden West is on PS4, Forza, why do I keep saying Forza? What is wrong with me? Uh, Gran Turismo 7 is on PS4. God of War Ragnarok is on PS4. I feel like those that might have held those games back a little bit, you know what I mean? On a technical aspect. I love God of War Ragnarok. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I'm honestly like, it's either that or The Last of Us, the first Last of Us, that I think is the single greatest PlayStation exclusive of all time. But on a technical aspect, not that it's bad, but it feels like a PS4 game that was like enhanced for PS5 instead of it being like a PS5 game that they got to work on a PS4, you know, when you play it on PS4. Like, God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West in particular, those those are perfect system sellers. Those would have sold PS5s like crazy, but 
they weren't exclusive. So that was that. And then other things like the decision to close Sony or PlayStation Japan, you know. Uh, I, they, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Japanese market is not really the biggest market. Like, it's not as big as the uh, North American market, right? Um, so I get it, but still it's like, you know, you kind of... Like, that was a big part of PlayStation for a while. And you just just killed it. Uh, and other stuff, like, trying not to do, like, doing too big to fail type of games, you know, that's where we got The Last of Us Part 1, like, the remake. That came from the decision to do games that were too big to fail. Because the last, a Last of Us remake isn't gonna fail. People are gonna buy that. And, uh, I think my, it might have underperformed sales-wise anyways, but still, like, you know, do, doing that, and all these live service games, I feel like the lull period we're in, th like, the PS5 is in right now, it's, I feel like that was probably due to Jim Ryan, because after Spider-Man, what comes out for the PS5, you know, you could say Hell Divers. no one, I, I, I don't, I've not heard anybody who gives a shit about Hell Divers. um, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth looks amazing, I'll give you that one, I cannot wait for that game, uh, by, I almost don't even see that as, like, a PlayStation game, even though it is exclusive, and I think, like, Sony might have helped with the game, uh, which is why it's exclusive, but, uh, I could be wrong on that, by the way, but, I, it's just, like, PlayStation, they don't have anything coming up, they got Wolverine, of course, they got Rise of the Ronin, so we do know of stuff that they have coming up, but, like, we don't know when we're going to see them. And I can't help but think that, like, before Jim Ryan was president of PlayStation, we didn't have this problem. They weren't raising prices for the PS Plus for no reason. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't do shit like that. They weren't just like, okay, we're going to put all of our eggs in the... Uh, live service basket, you know, and live service games, by the way, are supposed to, like, compete against each other, so the, I don't understand why you would want to have so many live service games from you, you do so many live service games, because they are competing with yourself, I can't help but think that all that did not happen under Jim Ryan, and then, and now Jim Ryan comes in, and that stuff is happening, you know, uh, now it's not all bad stuff that Jim Ryan, like, did, but I, I feel like we were kind of getting into a bit of, like, a greedy sort of, uh, you know, ego sort of PlayStation. It's like, uh, Sony, when the PS3 came out, they thought they can get away with, uh, selling the PS3 for $600 at launch, and that was 2006, and, uh, I feel like, you know, they've been so successful for a while now, they're starting to feel like they can get away with anything, uh, and I feel like with Jim Ryan leaving, they can be humbled a little bit, so that's just my thoughts, I, I hope, we're, we're still gonna see the effects of Jim Ryan at PlayStation, not, he wasn't, like, Here's the thing. While I did, I do disagree a lot with, uh, with like a lot of the stuff Jim Ryan did uh, under PlayStation. I feel like a lot of that we haven't really seen yet. You know, we haven't gotten all those uh, uh, live service games. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the PS Plus prices have not raised yet. Um, you know, and we're starting to finally see some. PlayStation games be, like, new-gen exclusive. Which, finally. You know what I mean? Finally. You know, Spider-Man 2 is a PS5 exclusive. That's a system seller. That is a system seller. Um, but yeah, I can't help but say good riddance for Jim Ryan. But at the same time, you know, 
like a lot of people are kind of like celebrating that he's leaving PlayStation. Let the man retire in peace. Just l l let him let him go. Let him go on his severance package and uh, let him enjoy the rest of his life. Because he was with PlayStation for a while. He was with Sony for a hell of a long time. It was just like the past few years where he actually took this leadership role. So, yeah, that's Jim Ryan. Uh, I spent a lot of time on that. Uh, speaking of a lot of time... Uh, there's a lot. I'm going over a lot about the strikes. Starting with the writer strike, it ended. The writer strike ended uh, two days ago. Yeah, two days ago, right? It was like two or three days ago. So this is coming to us uh, from Variety. The writer strike is over. WGA votes to lift strike order after 148 days. That is the headline. Um, on the 148th day of work stoppage, sorry, I thought I heard something, of work stoppage, the board of the WGA West and Council of the WGA East voted unanimously on Tuesday to lift the strike order as of 12.01 a.m. Uh, Pacific time on Wednesday. Excuse me. Following a tentative agreement on a new minimum basic agreement uh, with contract or a MBA contract with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television's producer or the AMPTP which is what I'm going to be referring to them as. That means writers can go back to work as of Wednesday even before the final ratification vote on the contract. The unanimous decision to end the strike comes two days after the writers in Hollywood Studios successfully concluded talks for a three-year MBA deal on September 24th. Following a marathon negotiation session, the two sides were able to find compromises on key sticking points, including generative AI and the creative process, minimum staffing requirements for writers' rooms, and streaming residuals. The vote to lift the strike order followed unanimous votes by the WGA's negotiation committee, the WGA West Board, and WGA East Council to send the contract to members for ratification. Until now, the WGA has maintained the work stoppage uh, was still in effect, telling membership when the tentative deal was struck Sunday... To be clear, uh, no, this is in quotes now. To be clear, no one is to return to work until specifically authorized by the guild. Like, to do so by the guild. We are still on strike until then. But we are, but we are as of today, suspending WGA picket, picketing. Instead, instead, if you are able, we encourage you to join the SAG-AFTRA picket lines this week. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, SAG AFRA is still picketing the AMT the AMPTP, awaiting its turn to return to the negotiating table amid its 75 day strike. Um, and then it goes into uh, you know contract details, uh, specifically uh, AI details. AI can't write or rewrite literary material and AI generated material will not be considered source material under MBA, meaning that AI generated material can't be used to undermine a writer's credit or separated rights. A writer can choose to use AI when performing writing services if the company consents and provided that the writer follows applicable company pol policies, but the company isn't the company can't require the writer to use AI software, for example, ChatGPT, when performing writing services. <laughs> the company must disclose to the writer if any materials given to the writer have been generated by AI or incorporated or incorporate AI generated material, the WGA reserves the right to assert that exploitation of writers as material to train AI is prohibited by MBA or other law. So that's like 
Uh, and then the closing paragraphs. Uh, the WGA's ratification vote will be held from October 2nd to October 9th. The WGA will host member meetings on both co coasts this week in person and on Zoom to discuss the details of the contract. Given the enthusiasm and the enthusiastic, sorry about that. The enthusiastic endorsement of the, the WGA uh, negotiating committee, it is expected to be easily ratified by strike-weary members. <laughs> Excuse me. The WGA West will hold a member meeting Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Time The Hollywood at the Hollywood... Uh, okay, so not really important. Um, so, yeah. The WGA strike has been pretty much resolved. Uh, I think we're still waiting on, like, final stuff. Uh, they got the AI stuff sorted. AI, get the fuck out of here. Can I just say, like, I don't, like, I did learn throughout the weeks and throughout the strike, like, it, like I was in full support of the of the uh, the guilds, like the uh, the actors and the writers, and I was I was definitely vilifying the uh, the corporate executives. Um, and I did learn that, like you know, there is it's both sides. It's not just the business people being corporate greedy business people although that is a good part of that um but it's 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 both sides of the coin um the thing is though i just if if you if you even like think about introducing the idea of like fucking AI replacing people like that like I'm sorry Ye I don't think how I don't understand how you like thought about that idea and thinking like oh yeah no one's gonna have a problem with this no one's gonna have a problem with their with their work their livelihood being ruined just to so they could be replaced by a fucking robot that doesn't even know originality yet but whatever I can get beyond that because that's been sorted out what, like, they finally got to meet, and the thing, the my main takeaway is how the fuck and why the fuck did it take 148 days to sort this out? They should have met day, I was going to say day one, no, they should have fucking met day negative one. Uh, the, 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 this, this strike should have never happened. Should have never happened. Um, and I think we're going to see the uh, effects of the strike. You know, uh, we've seen we've seen the effects of the strike, but I feel like we mostly saw like started to immediately see the effects of the uh, actors strike, um, you know, because that you can't have actors shooting movies and you also can't have them promoting movies so like m some movies got delayed dune got delayed because of uh the actor strike nothing like a bunch of movies and shows got delayed because of the writer strike but that's just because like m m but no no it was like movies and shows that were not, like, set to come out in a number of months. You know, one show that I know got delayed, my fa my one of my favorite shows, Cobra Kai, got delayed because its final season uh, was about to begin shooting, and then the writers went on strike, and then the actors went on strike. Uh, you know, and that was a lot of shows. So, I'm... I'm happy that they got it sorted out. I wish they could have fucking done this sooner. Uh, but yeah... Uh, that's that. Uh, moving on, we got SAG AFTRA. This is one of two SAG uh, topics. One of them is an authorization authorization to strike against video games. Uh, this comes to us ex directly from SAG AFTRA. Uh, 
SAGRAFRA uh, members approve video game strike authorization vote with 98.32% yes vote. Um, so this reads, members sig signal their determination to reach a deal as the union prepares to resume. Oh no, that's, that's a different, <laughs> I'm so stupid. sag after members have voted, uh, 98.32% in favor of a strike authorization on the interactive media agreement that covers members' work on video games. <laughs> 34,687 members cast ballots, representing a voting percentage of 27.47% of eligible vo voters. <laughs> Excuse me. The strike authorization does not mean the union is calling a strike. Make that clear. They're not striking. Uh, SAG-AFTRA has been in media agree in interactive media agreement negotiations with uh, signatory video game companies. Uh, it lists well, it lists a lot of them here: Activision, uh, Blindlight, Disney, uh, specific specifically Disney Character Voice Voices Inc., uh, EA. Uh, Formosa Interactive, Insomniac, Epic, Take Two Productions, or Interactive. It says Productions here, here though. Voice Works and WB Games. Some of those I don't think are video game companies. I think they are, um, uh, like they work with video game companies. Uh, and th like, yeah, they work with video game companies. I believe throughout the negotiations. Uh, the companies have refused to offer accept acceptable terms on some of the vo on some of the issues most critical to our members, including wages that kept that keep up with inflation protections protections around uh, exploitative uses of artificial intelligence and basic safety precautions. Uh, so the next bargain bargaining session is scheduled for September twenty sixth, seventh, and eighth. <sighs> It's like right going on right now, and we hope the added leverage of a successful strike authorization vote will compel the companies to make significant movement on critical issues where we are still far apart. Reading a quote, uh, it's time for the video game companies to stop playing games and get serious about searching an agreement on this contract. Making a little joke about video game companies. Um... This is the uh, the SAG after president Fran Drescher. Uh, so the result of this vote shows our members, our membership understands the existential nature of these negotiations, and that the time is now for these companies, which are making billions of dollars playing their CEOs, uh, paying their CEOs uh, lavishly, to give our performers an agreement that keeps performing in video games as a viable career. F, uh, okay, there's a lot more, but yeah, I think you get the idea. Um, I remember, like, this topic came up at first. I, had, I can't believe this is the second time I'm mentioning this in this podcast, but this is, I remember this topic came up, not, like, the topic of voice actors. It came up uh, during the controversy about the Bayonetta 3 thing with uh, Helena Taylor, you know, and that was before it turns out she lied about the whole thing. Um, and like I, re I remember my big takeaway from that before it fucking got out of control was voice actors need like they they need to be paid better than this. And then that discussion kind of got lost, you know. Um, it became a thing about boycotting, and uh, it's just. But voice actors, as voice actors in general, it's not just video games. Voice actors in general, like, get they're underpaid, you know. And uh, I just, I, I think, uh, you know, and this won't have like I uh, our next topic, the actors' strike, is probably gonna end soon. So, uh, um, I don't know what that means for this authorization, 
But and I want to make a some. I want to make it clear once again. This is an authorization to strike against video game companies. It's not like they are striking against video game companies. This is just they could. Um. Now I think that might be a part of the uh, the negotiations that are going through right that they're going through right now. So yeah, um, this won't have like as bi if it does go through, if it does happen, this won't have as much of an effect on video games, like nearly as much as it did movies and television. You know, it, the companies that named here. Let me just see it again. Activision, EA, Disney, uh, Insomniac, Epic, Take Two. And uh, WB. So that would probably like that's say take Insomniac for example. That's not gonna delay Spider Man, but it is gonna delay. It it would probably delay Wolverine. You know, uh, and I think I read when this first like came up. I read like this wouldn't. This was before Mortal Kombat One came out. This isn't gonna delay Mortal Kombat One or its DLC. Or anything like that, but it could delay future DLC. So that's the effect it could have. But like, even then, like they're not striking against like any of the none of the big three. You know, Nintendo, Sony, or Microsoft. They're not striking against any of them. They're not striking against companies like Capcom or Sega or Konami or Namco, Square Enix. You know, they're not striking Ubisoft. Even uh, you would think Ubisoft would be a uh, in there, uh, but no, they're, they're not striking against any of those companies. So, uh, um, so yeah, uh, I sorry, I I just got a really my aunt just sent me a really fucking f joke. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll read to you read that to you afterwards, but I'm I'm kind of um, I I lost my train of thought, but yeah, I think. You know, I stand with the actors and writers. Fair pay is always, you know, fair pay. You get what you negotiate. And uh, you should get what you ne negotiate. And it should be something that's fair. Uh, I don't think they're going to strike against video games. Uh, I, I don't think Activision, EA, Insomniac, Epic, uh, Disney, and... Warner Brothers. Well, the latter two are already uh, part of the strikes, but like the other, you know what I mean. I don't think they're going to be involved that much because of the next story. But before we get into that, my aunt just sent me a joke. I developed such anxiety about getting in elevators that I finally had to take steps to deal with it. Just wanted to read you that one. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on, uh, to another SAG AFRA, uh, topic. This is SAG AFRA, this is coming to us from Variety. Zag, Zag, SAG AFRA and AMPTP to resume, uh, strike negotiations on Monday. This reads, um, lead negotiators for SAG AFRA and the alliance, um, uh, that's, uh, the AMPTP, uh, will head back to the table on Monday, October 2nd, after a bitter concurrent strike led by the Writers Guild of America was resolved on Tuesday. Quote, sag -Afra and the AMPTP will resume negotiations for a new tv slash theatrical contract on Monday, October 2nd. Uh, several executives from AMPTP member companies will be in attendance. Uh, sag -Afra said in a statement. sag -Afra no negotiations lead uh, Duncan... I'm sorry. Uh, Uh-oh. I'm sorry. The, the, indent, the indent kind of like fucked me up. But uh, Duncan uh, Crattree, Ireland... sag -Afra negotiations lead Duncan C Crattree, Ireland... And Union President Fran Drescher are expected to convey with the producers with renewed 
uh, fervor as the creative community and innumerable innumerable uh, intersecting businesses uh, business breathed a sigh of relief that the WGA's 106 day war was it it's, I thought it was 108 but uh, uh, with the studios and streamers ended on September 26th uh, black channeling between Cratbury Cratree Ireland and the uh, four prominent media CEOs who helped broker the WGA deal. Uh, Bo- Disney's Bob Iger, D- NBC's Univ... N- <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Sorry, I cannot read. Disney's Bob Iger, NBC Universal's Donna Langley, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery's David Zaslav, and Netflix's Ted Sarandos uh, started immediately after the writers reached a tentative agreement, sources said. Uh, and it goes on more. So, yeah. So, the main takeaway there is that the writer, the, the uh, not the writer strike, the actor strike, is uh, wrapping up, and uh, we could it could be done on Monday, and uh, we heard a similar report about that, uh, uh, like that about the uh, writer strike, and uh, I remember. W- hearing about that, and then soon after, the writer's strike got resolved. So I am optimistic about the actor strike. It seems to be actually wrapping up. <laughs> it honestly felt like, you know, we had the writers and actor strike, like, both on strike at the same time. It felt like it, it would never end, you know? I almost thought, like... I wasn't quite sure which one, but I almost thought that one of these strikes was not going to... Like, I, I didn't think both of them would still be going on by then, but I think one of them would still be going on by the end of the year. So I'm really happy to see that, like, that's not the case. Or not yet the... It's looking like it's not going to be the case. I hope it. Uh, we can get this resolved. So we can go back and to seeing images from Deadpool three. The MCU as a whole can stop pushing uh, its fucking schedule. Cobra Kai, my, my show Cobra Kai, can finally release its final season. They can finally shoot its final season. You know, uh, and movies and television can go back to where they were. And yeah, that's that. Um, there's uh so yeah uh we got another topic here coming to us from the verge netflix drop 01 all the news from and trailers from netflix's animation event so basically netflix uh held an event where they just sh- dropped a whole bunch of trailers for their animated shows and movies uh so, Reading Your Netflix held a live stream event focused entirely on its lineup of animation called Drop 01. It was somewhat smaller in scale compared to other Netflix events like Tadum or, excuse me, uh, or Geeked Week. The streamer initially promised new looks at upcoming projects like Scott Pilgrim Takes Off and Sonic Prime, as well as the first three episodes of Castlevania Nocturne. Excuse me, which I haven't watched, by the way, but I'm excited to see that. We also got news about the upcoming series based on Devil May Cry and Tomb Raider. So we're going to go around. Uh, we got the first seven minutes of uh, Castlevania Nocturne. Uh, then we got uh, a new trailer for the new season. or No, it was like a first look at the new season of... Uh, Masters of the Universe Revelation, which, if I'm going to be honest, like, I watched the first season of that, and I just I just thought it was not good. Uh, but then, we got uh, a trailer for uh, the animated Tomb Raider series. Uh, so yeah, it is called uh, Tomb Raider The Legend of Lara Croft. All we got was like a little teaser. We didn't really get a proper look at it. Like, we didn't get to see any episodes, but like, I think I did remember hearing that, uh, it's, um, that we are, that, what was I saying? We, I, I did remember hearing that 
Netflix was working on a Tomb Raider animated series. So to see like a look at it, I think it's pretty cool. It's supposed to come out sometime in 2024. Scott Pilgrim uh, takes off. I'm I'm already sold on that. November 17th. Uh, Blue Eyes Samurai uh, looks interesting. Uh, Captain Laserhawk, a blood dragon uh, remix. Uh, this is... <coughs> A Far Cry from Far Cry. Uh, I'm reading uh, the little excerpt by Andrew Webster. A Far Cry from Far Cry. Captain Laserhawk, a Blood Dragon remix, an adaptation of the Far Cry spinoff Blood Dragon. Starts streaming on October 19th, that's really soon. Uh, and you can get a taste of its cyberpunk world in this new trailer. So yeah, it's a, uh, like, it's... Uh, I played Far Cry 3... I didn't play uh, Blood Dragon, though. Uh, that was like a DLC expansion spin-off sort of thing for Far Cry 3. Um, uh, and... But it's... So this seems to be like a... Uh, like a cyberpunk sort of world for... A, like, that's kind of like Far Cry, but not really. I think it's pretty cool. Uh... It comes out October nineteenth. That's really soon. Uh, I was I didn't I was not expecting it to come out that soon. Uh, a new look at Sonic Prime. I've not I've yet to watch this show, but it looks really cool. Um, and then Netflix is making a Devil May Cry anime. I'm gonna read the excerpt here. Dante is coming back in an animated in animated form at. Its Drop 01 event, Netflix announced it, that it is teaming up with Capcom for a new animated series based on the action series Devil May Cry. Adi Shankar, who previously worked on Netflix's adaptation of Castlevania, will serve as showrunner, while Studio Murr will be handling the animation. There's no premiere date yet, but Netflix lists the show as coming soon, so you can get a very brief taste in the teaser trailer above. So yeah, kind of like, uh, if you, in case you don't know what I was just doing, I, I, I kind of just uh, pulled them out and just started watching some of the trailers. So, um, yeah, kind of like the Tomb Raider show. Uh, we don't really know much about uh, the Devil May Cry series because it didn't really give us that much. Uh, but I'm excited. This show I know was like... I don't know if it's been in development for a while or if it was just like announced for a while, but I remember like... Um, I like... It was when I caught up on Castlevania, you know... Uh, I didn't watch the uh, all the seasons when they came out. I only saw the fourth one when it came out. I like sh shortly before the fourth season. I actually watched the three, the first three seasons, uh, so I got all caught up. But um, uh, um, it was. I remember like seeing a review for. I it was like season two, I think, and I was like when season two came out, um. And I remember, I remember the uh, the reviewer saying, uh, "I'm interested to see uh, what the guys behind this is creating. Like they're cr also creating Devil May Cry. So like it was that was back then when we knew about uh, this Devil May Cry show being done by the same guy who uh, did uh, who did Castlevania. So." I'm I'm excited. Uh, I feel like this is a show that's been in the works for a while, and wow, like I'm surprised that like how like the video game adaptations, the video game shows in here as well. Like Tomb Raider, we got Devil May Cry, we got Sonic, um, we got a uh, uh, Castlevania, uh, which I'm going to I'm probably gonna watch that like after I'm done here, um, and. Uh, we got a uh, uh, Blood Dragon. We got Captain Laserhawk, of course. Uh, that looks amazing. I'm I'm excited. Netflix is Netflix is cooking. They're 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 uh, who let bro cook? You know what I mean? They're cooking with uh, 
with animation. And of course, like not just video games, the it's the Scott Pilgrim show they got. Scott Bil Scott Pilgrim takes off. I'm excited for that. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm I, I'm. I'm excited for the future of Netflix animation. I think this all looks great. Uh, I don't. I'm not too familiar with uh, Blue Eyes Samurai. L let me go watch that trailer. That looks awesome. Uh, the writers of Logan and Blade Runner 2049 are doing it as well. Uh, the excerpt reads. Uh, the latest addition to Netflix's original anime lineup, Blue Eyes Samurai, tells the story of Mizu, a mixed race monster of the sword. Master, why did I read monster? What the fuck's wrong with me? Uh, of the sword who lives a, li a life change. I can't read it. It's, I'm, I've been going for too long, but uh, lives uh, a life in disguise seeking the deliverance of revenge. The series starts streaming on November 3rd. That's, uh, this looks sick. We got some sick uh, animated series about uh, uh, coming to Netflix, and I'm excited. Uh, so, yeah, um, that'll do it. I, I know I said that we're gonna talk about the uh, the Xbox leak. W w what can I say about that that hasn't already been said? Not much. Uh, I are uh, Greg talked about it on the MeCast station, so. Yeah, uh, that'll do it for this episode of DPX Talks for about an hour. Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, if you're on uh, SoundCloud or Spotify, because remember, I'm on Spotify now, uh, go over to my YouTube channel, D DPX Solo. Go subscribe. You can see the full video version of this on the channel. Uh, and you get some other stuff. You get, I, I got a new episode of Solo Missions cooking. There's top 10 lists. There's reviews. Uh, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh... A lot of games come out soon, uh, and yeah, uh, so that'll do it for this episode of DPX Talks for about an hour. Uh, of course, if you're on YouTube, go to uh, Spotify or SoundCloud, and uh, be sure to uh, give me a follow. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye!